God, we thank you for your immense grace, which we could not deserve, which we have not earned, but you have only bestowed freely according to your plan and your purpose, your kindness and your goodwill. God, we pray as we open your word together this morning that you would indeed speak, that you would captivate us by who you are and what you have done. May your word have its way in our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, our students, middle school and high school students, are away at summer camp, and uh, that means Josh Kelso is there with them as well. I'm so thankful for Josh taking us through the book of James. Uh, this week and next, we'll be in Romans 9, and then Josh will finish up the month of June completing his sermons in the book of James. So a little bit disjointed. Uh, thank you for your patience with that. And beginning in July, we'll be back in the book of Romans. I want to begin this morning by reading the text we're looking at both this week and next. Romans chapter 9, verses 24 to 29. I'd like to read it and you can follow along with me. God, according to verse 23, prepared vessels beforehand for glory, even us whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. Not many in this room are of Jewish descent, and yet you read a Jewish book, you worship the God of Israel, and you have placed all of your confidence in a Jewish Messiah. The 2,000 years of church history have gotten us accustomed to being Gentiles grafted into the rich roots of Jewish patriarchs, Jewish promises, Jewish privilege. And we're not shocked by it anymore. We don't feel like outsiders having been graciously brought in. And what God was doing in the church in the first century, and in the church at Rome in particular, was bringing in large numbers of Gentiles to a relationship to him by his grace in the gospel of his son, the Messiah, Jesus. And this was surprising. This was unexpected. This created tensions. In fact, much of the New Testament is embedded with the tension created by Jew-Gentile relationships in this new enterprise called the church begun in Acts 2, a mystery to the Old Testament, newly revealed. Jews and Gentiles together in one body, this new entity called the church. I want to begin this morning with an illustration from the ministry of Jesus. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 15. And we're going to look at Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman, a woman from Syrophoenicia. She is a Canaanite. And if you think back in your biblical history, the Canaanites were one of the ites of the land that Israel was to go in and possess. And the command strictly from the Lord was that these people had so polluted the land and had so defied their creator that they were to be judged by God. And Israel was to be the implement of God's judgment of the Canaanite peoples. They were to be completely eradicated. They were actually to pay for their sins and meet their maker. Of course, Israel disobeyed 
and the Canaanites were not eradicated. And in Jesus' earthly ministry, we have a descendant of the Canaanite people with whom Jesus interacts. Notice what happens. Verse 21, Matthew 15. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. This is Gentile territory on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord. And listen to what she says. Son of David. What does she know in calling Jesus Lord and Son of David? That he is indeed the Lord and he is Messiah according to Scripture. This is the expected one. And, and she's crying out to him. She says, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But Jesus did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, send her away because she keeps shouting at us. And here, Jesus' disciples, Jews, offended, distracted, annoyed, that a Canaanite woman, a mother whose child is cruelly oppressed, a woman in desperate need is coming to the only possible hope. Of course, Jesus knows what's in her heart and knows what he's about to do, but his disciples need to see something. And so Jesus answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and, and she was speaking to him, bowing down before him, saying, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, for even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. What is she acknowledging? Yes, I'm outside of the covenant promises that were made to Israel, and yet this Jesus, this son of David, this Messiah is my only hope. Jesus said to her, O oh woman, your faith is great. You know, Jesus never said that to his disciples. O oh, ye of little faith. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Shocking. And yet you and I find ourselves in this scene. We are the dogs, the outsiders getting the crumbs from the table. And we know that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is our only hope for the cruel oppression under which we were born and from which we must be liberated. And we find here the mercy and compassion and plan of God to save Gentiles. And of course, that explodes in the New Testament with the inpouring of Gentiles into the church alongside of Jews who have embraced Messiah and opposed by Jews who rejected Messiah. What we need to see in Romans chapter 9 this morning is what Jews and Gentiles learn from God's dealings with Israel. That's what we're learning this week and next. What Jews and Gentiles learn from God's dealings with Israel. And, and we're going to learn that God, number one, has a heart and a plan to save Jews and Gentiles. We're going to learn as well that God saves contrary to merit. That means anybody that gets saved is only saved by grace, not by who they are. Heretic, heretic, her, heretic what am I trying to say? That by who their parents were, <laughs> nor by what they have accomplished. Our accomplishments only incur the wrath of God. We must be rescued by grace. And then thirdly, we'll find out that God always keeps a remnant saved by grace through faith. That's what we'll be looking at this week and next. And what we learn, first of all, in Romans 9, 24, is that God has a heart and a plan to save Jews and Gentiles. And to understand verse 24, it's the completion of the sentence that begins in verse 23. God is accomplishing the things he's doing. He has vessels fit for destruction and he has vessels of mercy. And those vessels of mercy, verse 23, he prepares beforehand for glory. And who are those vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory? This is where we pick up in verse 24. Even us. Can you believe it? Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but 
also from among the Gentiles. And here in this verse in Romans 9, 24, we get so much of the heart of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a, a Jew. And notice he, he talks about us. He includes himself, a Jew, with the Gentiles. That was not a common Jewish perspective leading up to the first century. Jews and Gentiles getting along together, and Paul says, us, look at us, can you believe it? Saved by grace together as a vessel prepared for mercy. I think Paul just can't get over the fact that he himself was saved by grace. 1 Timothy 1 tells us that Paul saw himself as the chief of sinners. You, you name all the terrible, awful, most terrible deeds that men have done, and you put Paul at the front of the line, ahead of them all. In his own mind, he was convinced that he was chief of sinners. And he said that God's grace was poured out to him. God's mercy was shown him. Mercy was the only thing that could help him, such that a world watching in on Paul's life would understand that if God could save Paul, God could save anybody. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. I think Paul just never got over God's grace. Even us, vessels of mercy. And these are the ones whom God called. All, Jew, Gentile, all leveled by depravity. All at the same level. All united together with all of humanity since the fall of Adam in sinful rebellion against God from birth by nature. All in the same forsaken, hopeless condition. And all leveled by grace. No one gets into a relationship with God except by his grace. Undeserved love, unmerited kindness through the gospel of his crucified son. And when Paul says these are those whom he called, this is the effectual calling of God unto salvation. This is when the Holy Spirit draws you to Jesus Christ to trust that he pays for your sins and to cast your life into his care, to surrender to Christ and to find new life and forgiveness and eternity and everything. And Paul says... We are called, not from the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. And, and both of these categories are near and dear to Paul's heart. Paul calls the Jews his own countrymen, and he weeps for them. We'll see in the next chapter of Romans that Paul's heart and his compassion is for his own countrymen who have not yet embraced the gospel. And yet Paul was called specially by Jesus to be the apostle of the Gentiles. And so he loved Jew and Gentile alike. And his ministry was characterized by taking the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And so for those to be called from Jew and Gentile alike was a joy to the heart of the Apostle Paul and in keeping with God's plan. And I think you hear the shock of Gentile salvation in the way that Paul words verse 24. Vessels prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called from the Jews and also from the Gentiles. Can you believe it? It's incredible. And of course, it has always been God's plan to save Gentiles. People written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world, from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. But Jew and Gentile believers on equal footing in the church, what Paul calls in Ephesians 2.15, one new man, was a mystery not revealed in the Old Testament, newly revealed in the church age. God has a heart to save Jew and Gentile. He has a heart to save sinners who don't deserve it by his grace, by unmerited favor. That leads us to the second point. We'll spend the remainder of our time here this morning in point number two. Second thing we need to learn from God's dealings with Israel is that God saves contrary to merit. God saves contrary to merit. What you and I have earned, what we deserve by our nature, spilling out into our activities, thought, word, deed, motives, have only earned us God's wrath, eternal anger against our sin. We have only prepared ourselves for an eternity in hell under God's unflinching justice. And yet if you were in Jesus Christ this morning, you experience something different. 
That is Paul's point here in verses 25 and 26 of Romans 9, that God saves contrary to merit. And he appeals in these two verses to the prophet Hosea. As he says also in Hosea, Romans 9, 25, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who is not beloved, beloved. And it shall be in that place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. And Paul quotes Hosea 2.23 and Hosea 1.10. Paul's point here is to demonstrate that God saves people who do not deserve to be saved, that the unloved become loved, that those who did not receive compassion receive compassion, that those who were not his people become his people. What Paul demonstrates is that God is gracious to sinners. That God loves to be kind to people who have only merited his wrath. And he does this by rehearsing for us God's dealings with Israel from the prophet Hosea. And Jews benefit from these two quotations by direct application. Gentiles benefit by analogy. Hosea's words, quoted here by Paul, are a reference specifically to Israel. And Paul rehearses God's dealings with Israel in order to demonstrate to Jews and to Gentiles alike the heart of God to save undeserving sinners. I believe that many biblical scholars miss Paul's point here because they assume that Hosea's prophecy is about Gentile conversion, Gentile salvation. And they also believe that Hosea's prophecy is fulfilled in the church because Paul quotes it here. In fact, they read Romans 9 something like this. God saves Gentiles, verse 24. Gentiles were not the people of God, not loved by God, verse 25. But now they are sons of the living God, verse 26. And they assume that the reference to all of these verses is Gentiles. Not the people of God, now the people of God. That, however, is not Paul's meaning. And it is certainly not Hosea's meaning. Romans 9, 25, and 26 are about Israel, just as when Hosea uttered those words the first time. They were about Israel then. They are about Israel today. And the prophecy that Hosea gives us has not yet been fulfilled. And we can't skate past the details here, or we will miss something really rich in our Bibles, something very near to the heart of God and something very applicable to our own lives as Jew and Gentile together in the church, in the church age. We need to spend the remainder of our time this morning in Hosea so that we understand, first of all, what these quotations mean, and secondly, how they are being used by Paul in Romans 9. And so what we get this morning is something of a bonus hermeneutics lesson. Uh, Hermeneutics is the set of rules we use to understand language, understand the Bible, Uh, These are the rules that lawyers use to understand contracts. These are the words that judges are, are the rules that judges are supposed to use to understand constitution. Uh, These are the rules that function according to language. Hermeneutics is the the, the set of rules we use to understand our Bibles. And so uh, this morning is a little bit of a hermeneutics lesson, specifically in how to understand an Old Testament text that is quoted in the New Testament. Lesson number one, a scripture passage will always mean what it always meant. A scripture passage will always mean what it always meant. Secondly, a passage of Scripture can never mean something different than what it originally meant. It's the negative way to say the same thing. Scripture meanings don't change over time. This is why God has his truth written down, inscripturated, so that it could not morph, could not change. It is uh, set in stone, as it were. It's meaning forever set by being written down. It's like writing your name in wet concrete. This is why so many Old Testament texts are introduced with an introductory formula like, it is written, or it stands written. That is, an Old Testament text was written a long time ago, and it still stands as it was writ. That's how these quotes are often introduced. 
And what we must get at is authorial intent. Who is the author and what did the author intend to communicate? And of course, when you're dealing with the author in scripture, who wrote the book of Hosea? Hosea did. And who wrote the book of Hosea? God did. We're dealing with dual authorship, and, and the, the authorship of the divine intent is not different than the authorship of the human intent. God communicated through human language, through human writers, to convey his mind, his heart. And authorial intent can be discovered by careful study, word meanings, context, historical setting, grammatical relationships, pronouns. And when a New Testament writer quotes the Old Testament, there are a number of different ways that he can do it. There are a number of different reasons that he might do it. Some are simply an illusion. Some is the importing of an Old Testament context into a New Testament setting. Sometimes a New Testament writer is interpreting an Old Testament text. But one thing that never happens is that a New Testament citation changes the meaning of an Old Testament text. No, the Old Testament text still means what it always meant. And it's important for us to discover why the New Testament writer is quoting it and why he's using it the way he is. And there's not one answer that governs every New Testament use of an Old Testament text. Sometimes the New Testament is giving the interp interpretation of an Old Testament text, but not always. In fact, very often the New Testament writer is not interpreting the Old Testament text he is quoting. Often, he is demonstrating a similarity in God's purpose. But never does a New Testament writer change the meaning of an Old Testament text. I know this is a little bit technical, but it's really important for understanding the passage we're looking at this morning. It's really important for us to properly understand Hosea first, and then to discern how the Apostle Paul is employing the words of Hosea to further his argument in Romans chapter 9. And if we fail to read Hosea, and we simply read Romans 9 with the assumption that Paul is giving us the meaning of Hosea's prophecy, then we will see the word Gentiles in verse 24. Do you see it there? Followed by the introduction, as he says also in Hosea, and then the quotation of Hosea 2.23, followed by the quotation of Hosea 1.10, we might wrongly assume that Hosea's prophecy has something to do with Gentile salvation. And then if you're in your Robert Murray McShane Bible reading plan and, or your chronological Bible reading plan and someday you get around to reading Hosea and you're looking for Gentile salvation in the book of Hosea and it's not there, what do I do? This is a dilemma. Did Paul get it wrong? Did, did the meaning of Hosea change somehow? Or was there some deep spiritual meaning in Hosea all along that no one could ever have gotten by reading it until the New Testament came along to provide us with the decoder for the secret message? And the conclusion that many come to is that either the church has replaced Israel and thereby becomes the recipient of all of Israel's promises, or that the church and Israel are the same thing. Israel was simply the church in the Old Testament. The church now is Israel in the New Testament. But neither of these views is in accord with the biblical record. In fact, to make either of these views work, one has to make biblical texts mean something different than they say. And all of this dilemma was created with the faulty assumption that Paul here is giving us the interpretation of Hosea's prophecy. Let's put that assumption on hold for just a moment, and let's go back and let's read Hosea's prophecy. It's 14 chapters, so put on your seatbelt. Listen quickly. No, we're not going to read the whole thing. We'll highlight. But we want to read it the way that we should read all of God's word, with a right understanding of God and a right understanding of ourselves. When, we, when we're to read the Bible with a right understanding of God, we begin with this truth. God does not lie. God does not go back on his word. God keeps his promises. God invented language. God had the desire and capacity to communicate clearly. This book, this Bible, is his word. It is his self-disclosure. It is his communication, and it conforms to the way that human language works. The second understanding we must have is about ourselves. 
You see, the problem with the Bible, if we can say it that way, is not with God or with his integrity or with his ability to communicate. The problem is with us. We, the readers, have hindrances. There are hurdles for us in terms of understanding. We're finite to begin with, and then we bring barriers to the clarity of Scripture that must be overcome. One of those barriers is simply language. Uh, We must get at word meanings and grammar, and the Bible was not written in English. It was not written in 21st century English. It was not written in emoticons. We have some overcoming to do to understand it. Another barrier for us is temporal, geographical, and cultural distance. We don't live in the ancient Near East. We're not familiar with the geography and the topography and the monetary units and units of measure. I mean, what is a cubit? You read about, you're going to have to go figure out what a cubit is to know how far away the boat was or how big the ark was or whatever. There's another barrier for us, and it really is a whole bunch of barriers. We might just lump under the category of sin. Of sin. Sin is a barrier for us understanding the clear communication of God. Fundamentally, if you're not born again, if you're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the Word of God and its truth, though accessible, will be veiled to you. A natural man does not have the capacity to understand spiritual things apart from the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate and, in effect, turn the lights on in the heart. Paul tells us that the, the, the Moses himself, the, the, the writings of the Old Testament, were veiled to Jews who rejected Christ. But when they become believers, all of a sudden they can see what was always there clearly. New birth is the first requirement to get over this huge hurdle, this impossible hurdle called sin and what some call the noetic effects of sin, the effects of sin on the brain. We don't think right until we're born again. Another barrier under the category of sin is satanic blinding. The God of this world blinds the minds of unbelievers so they do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another category under sin is divine judicial hardening. That is, if you turn your back on the light, Jesus said, light has come into the world. Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You choose to love darkness and God may give you more darkness. That's a terrifying reality. It happened in Matthew 13 when the religious leadership in Israel rejected Jesus as Messiah. They rejected his words. They actually claimed that it was satanic. And then Jesus began to speak in parables and not clearly in public as a judgment. You want darkness, you can have more darkness. And then another category that relates to sin is a compromised conscience. And this can affect a believer's understanding of Scripture. Listen, if you're harboring sin that you don't want to let go of, you don't want to repent of, and you come to a passage that addresses that sin, are you going to let the Word of God have sway in your heart at that moment? No, you're compromised in your ability to understand and yield to God's Word. In fact, you'll actually invent wrong interpretations of Scripture to protect an idol or some unturned from sin. These hindrances must be overcome first by regeneration, and then these hindrances must be overcome by sanctified study. That is, set set myself apart unto holiness in worship of the Lord and sit under God's word and seek to work hard. Word study, context, historical background, grammatical relationships. This is the process of feeding on God's word and feeding myself on God's word and growing in discernment and growing in my love for him. Think about what it was like when, if you're married now, when you were dating or in pursuit of uh, of a marriage partner and what it was like to get a handwritten letter, to to hang on every word, to, to, to look at all of it in its details and in its context, you, you love this person, and, and you want to know them, and, and so you want to know carefully what they meant by what they said. This is the believer's attitude towards the Word of God. And so it's helpful for us to look at the book of Hosea. I hope you've turned there already. If you have to use your table of contents in the front of your Bible to get there, that's great. 
Um, we're going to be doing a flyby survey of the book of Hosea. Prophet Hosea was a contemporary of Isaiah. He perhaps had a 50-year prophetic ministry, uh, speaking to the people of Israel and then writing what we have here in this book. Uh, his ministry spanned the kings of Uzziah through Hezekiah, the kings in Judah, and then of Jeroboam in the northern kingdoms of Israel. Uh, Hosea prophesied during the divided kingdom. You know, the kingdom split after Solomon, and you had northern tribes and southern tribes. The focus of Hosea's ministry was those northern tribes, the northern kingdom. They were the first to go into captivity. Uh, they really were the first uh, section of the nation of Israel to embrace idolatry, uh, and they were the first judged and removed from the land. In fact, Hosea is a set of prophecies that, that predicts the judgment against the northern tribes, predicts the Assyrian captivity. He predicts the end of Jeroboam's reign and the judgment against the house of Jehu. He predicts a future restoration of all of Israel, northern and southern tribes, to the land, repentant, unified, faithful to God. The, the prophetic ministry of of Hosea spans the past, present, and future of Israel, not only from his perspective, but even from our perspective. What's really unique about the book of Hosea is that God illustrated the message of this prophet, a message of judgment and future restoration, through Hosea's own marriage. God commanded Hosea to marry a woman of faulty character. She proved unfaithful to him, and he was to love her faithfully. It became a living picture of God's faithful love to Israel, despite her faithlessness to him. Israel's faithlessness is compared to adultery. And her spiritual adultery was an idolatry, a, a rejecting Yahweh as God, even though Yahweh was the one giving her all that she needed to survive, rejecting him and embracing everything under the sun to worship. Tragic history of Israel portrayed in this book. Uh, let's read together in Hosea chapter 1. The word of Yahweh which came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. When Yahweh first spoke through Hosea, Yahweh said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking Yahweh. So he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And Yahweh said to him, Name him Jezreel. Jezreel means God sows, not needle and thread but seeds in the ground, farming. So Hosea's son is named God sows, puts seed in the ground. And this is a theme that comes throughout the book of Hosea. And he says, name him Jezreel or God sows for yet a little while and I will punish the house of Jehu with the, for the bloodshed of Jezreel, uh, which is also the name of a valley uh, where the uh, northern uh, kingdom's reigns come to an end. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Then Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And Yahweh said to him, name her Lo Ruhamah, which means not loved, or I will not have compassion. Oh, don't name your daughters that, by the way. <laughs> For I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by Yahweh their God and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. That, by the way, was fulfilled uh, when 185,000 Assyrians were stopped short and dropped dead supernaturally without battle from Israel. And when she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, she conceived and gave birth to a son, and Yahweh said, name him Lo Ami, not my people. Don't name your son, not my people. But Hosea did. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. This is a heavy, tragic message from the God of Israel to Israel. Israel is God's people. 
And here God says to his prophet, name your son Lo Ami because I'm not their God anymore. They're not my people. Sounds like Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, leave. You can't come back in. Sounds like those awful words that Jesus said to those who claimed to know him but don't. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Sounds like Revelation 20. All those who names are not found written in the book of life, thrown into the lake of fire. Go away. The tragedy of this message spoken to Israel is it is exactly what they were asking for. In all of Israel's history, from their rescue all the way through, they said, Yahweh's not our God. We like Chemosh. We like Ashtoreth. We like Baal. And God says, okay, I'm not your God. You're not my people. And, and, And the poor prophet Hosea, besides marrying a woman who would prove unfaithful to him countless times, had children whose names reflected God's judgment against his people. And look at verse 10. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, who's the them in verse 10? Israel. In the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, who's the them? Israel. You are the sons of the living God. And the sons, verse 11, of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint for themselves one leader and they will go up from the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Say to your brothers, Ami, my people, and to your sisters, Ruhamah, loved. Which is it? Do they get judgment or restoration? Yes, both. In fact, this is the the theme of the book of Hosea. And, And Hosea, like every other prophet in the Old Testament, prophesies judgment for Israel and hope and restoration. There's only one Old Testament prophet that prophesies only judgment. And it's not against Israel. It's against Assyria. The book of Nahum. Every other prophet addressing Israel promises judgment and restoration. And Hosea is no different. And and I want to I like the way Charles Feinberg has summarized the the promises given to Israel here in 110 through 2.1. National increase, national conversion, national reunion, national leadership, and national restoration. And if you look at the details of the promises here in these few verses, these things have never yet been fulfilled in Israel. And yet this is a promise of God. I have in my notes to read all of chapter 2. We're not going to do that. Uh, Look down at verse 6. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. She will seek them, but will not find them. Sounds like the book of Ecclesiastes. Going after those things again and again and again in defiance of God, in defiance of the covenant that God made with his people, and being unsatisfied, unfulfilled, not finding what you're looking for. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband. Really? Is he going to take you? For it was better for me then than now. For she does not know it, that it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine and the oil, and I lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Isn't that what we do when we sin? Take the stewardship of God's lavish resources and spend them on idols. This was Israel's history. 
Verse 14, therefore, behold, I will allure her. There's a tender word that a prospective husband uses to woo a virgin bride. I will bring her into the wilderness and I will speak kindly to her. Verse 16, it will come about in that day, declares Yahweh, that you will call me Ishi, my husband, and you will no longer call me Bali, my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth. They will never be mentioned. In that day, I will also make a covenant for them. With the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the creeping things of the ground, I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land. I will make them lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and then you will know Yahweh. This word for betroth is, is the, the kind word that a man uses to woo a bride, a proposal. This, from God to Israel, is grace. He uses a word that a man uses of a virgin betrothed. What is God saying here? I will treat you as if you had never sinned, and I will betroth you to myself forever. It's all of grace. And then you will know Yahweh. Verse 23 I will sow her for myself in the land. There's that word sow. It comes up again and again in this book. Uh, remember Jezreel, God sows. Here, God, same word, will sow Israel into the land. And I will have compassion on her who have not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Listen, there's a day coming when Israel will say, Yahweh is our God, not Baal. Not Chemosh. Really remarkable promise. Chapter 3, perhaps, is the most important chapter. We are going to read this whole chapter. It's very short. Five verses. Then Yahweh said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as Yahweh loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and they love raisin cakes. Here, Hosea, is uh, the, the command is repeated. To, to love Gomer, same woman. This is not a second marriage. This is not a second wife. This is still Gomer, and she has been unfaithful. And God is saying she has already been unfaithful. Love her as a husband. So what does this whole deal with raisin cakes? Uh, point you to Jeremiah 7, 18 and 44, 19. Uh, raisin cakes were elements of ceremonial worship of the queen of heaven an idol, false god, that Israel was worshiping an open idolatry. For God to say they love raisin cakes was not about what kind of bagel do you want in the morning. <laughs> it was about open, flagrant, flaunting of idolatry in public that made God angry. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels. 15 shekels is half the price of an indentured servant. She was worthless. Then I said to her, and, and a homer and a half of barley, that's animal food. God redeemed her for nothing. And then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. In other words, uh, I won't be a husband to you yet, so I will also be towards you. For the sons of Israel will remain without king or prince for many days, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or household idols. Afterwards, the sons of Israel will return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to Yahweh and to his goodness in the last days. What you have in chapter 3, from Hosea's perspective, is the past, present, and future of Israel. And what you have from our perspective in these five verses of Hosea 3 is the past, present, and future of Israel. Israel's past is in verses 1 and 2. They were rebellious against God, committing spiritual harlotry, idolatry, faithless. And the rescuing of Israel from Assyrian and Babylonian captivity back to the land is in the past from our perspective. But it was not a rescuing unto national repentance 
and a united kingdom under one king in the line of David with fruition of the land. That hasn't happened yet. Where do we get the present state of Israel? Uh, in verses 3 and 4. Then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. Remarkable statement. The exile worked. Israel has never gone back to the idolatries that she adored prior to the exile. She has been monotheistic ever since. To this day, Israel is hotly monotheistic. I mean, what did they do when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God? They picked up stones. They said there was only one God, and it's Yahweh, the God of Israel. It doesn't mean that they loved him as a husband. It doesn't mean that they, as a nation, were in repentance. In fact, they were in the odd situation of not playing the harlot, verse 3, yet not having a man. Uh, they weren't pursuing all those other idols, but they weren't loving Yahweh. And verses 4 and 5 or verse 4 is continuing the present state of Israel. The sons of Israel will remain many days without king, without prince, without sacrifice, without sacred pillar, ephod, household idols. They are still in that state. The future of Israel is verse 5. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return, and they will seek Yahweh their God, and who? David their king. That's a reference to Jesus in the descent of David, the king, the Messiah, who will rule over the land. And they will come trembling to Yahweh and to his goodness in the last days. Look at chapter 7, verse 2. A significant portion of their sin... Israel did not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them, and they are before my face. Look down at verse 14. They do not cry to me from their heart when they wail on their beds. Listen, the nation was in misery. But for the sake of grain and new wine, they assemble themselves, and they turn away from me. They want stuff rather than God. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They turn, but not upward. They're like a deceitful bow. That is, an archer takes his bow and aims and shoots, but it always goes the wrong way. It always misses the target. Look at chapter 8 and verse 7. They sow the wind. There's that seed-sowing image again. And they reap the whirlwind. Sin is like that. You think you're sowing to a gentle breeze and a tornado is the result. Chapter 9, verse 10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit on the fig tree in its season. But they came to Baal Peor and they devoted themselves to shame. And they became as detestable as that which they loved. Verse 15, all their evil is at Gilgal. Indeed, I came to hate them there because of the wickedness of their deeds. I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. He says in verse 17, they will be wanderers among the nations. Chapter 10, verse 1, Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The more his fruit, the more altars he made. The richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. Their heart is faithless. Taking all of God's lavish gifts and spending them on idols. Verse 12, here's a plea, a command from God to Israel. Sow with a view to righteousness. Reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek Yahweh until he comes to rain righteousness on you. What a gracious appeal. God could have said, I'm done with you, faithless Israel. And he's making gracious appeal through his prophet. Chapter 11, verse 2. The more the prophets called to them, the more Israel went after the idols. Isn't that kind of what we do when we hear preaching we don't like? <laughs> Move on. Go somewhere else. Nothing to listen to here. 
Israel rejected the prophets and God's word through them. Chapter 12, verse 5, even Yahweh, the God of hosts, Yahweh is his name, return to your God, observe kindness and justice and wait for your God continually. Verse 7, a merchant in whose hands are false balances. The word for merchant there is the Hebrew word Canaanite. Here, God calls Israel a bad name. He calls his own people Canaanites. Think about the Syrophoenician woman, the Canaanite woman with great faith. Embraced the son of David, Messiah. And here Israel is called treacherous. The reason Canaanite is translated merchant is the Canaanites were known for their underhanded dealings at the table. Cheating for profit. Israel is called a Canaanite. In their hands are false balances they love to oppress. Ephraim, another term for Israel, says, Surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself and my labors. They will find in me no iniquity, which would be sin. God says, but I have been Yahweh your God since the land of Egypt. In verse 14, God makes this promise. First a plea, return, O Israel, to Yahweh your God. You've stumbled because of your iniquity. And then he says, verse 4, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. My anger turns away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily. He will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His shoots will sprout. His beauty will be like the olive tree. Down to the end of verse 9. For the ways of Yahweh are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. You see, the sin of Israel was great, and the grace of God is greater founded on his purposes and his promises. God made conditional covenant with Israel, the Mosaic covenant. You keep these rules, you'll be blessed. You break these rules, you'll be cursed. God also made unconditional covenant with Israel. I will make you a great nation. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you, Genesis 12. Rehearsed again in 2 Samuel 7 through the line of David. Rehearsed again, Jeremiah 31 through the new covenant when God promises he will take away their sins. Rehearsed again for us in the prophet Hosea and quoted in Romans chapter 9. What is Paul doing in Romans 9 with Hosea's prophecy? How does it relate to God's heart and purpose to save Jews and Gentiles? You see, the God who glories in turning enemies to sons among the people of Israel is the same God who makes Gentile enemies his sons too like the Syrophoenician woman and the centurion and most of us in this room. This is the heart of our God. Hosea's prophecy concerning Israel reveals the heart of God to take people who did not want to be God's people and to cause them to want to be his people. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, God has done this very thing for everyone who has believed in him. Man, woman, child, Jew, Gentile, whatever your background, whatever your sin, the grace of God is greater. And he says, come to me and be healed. Come to me and be forgiven. Come to me and be free. And when Paul wants to address Jews and Gentiles together in the church at Rome, he just can't believe that he... Paul, Saul, Paul, was saved by grace and that God would call Jews and Gentiles. Just as Hosea told us, God would take the people, his people, who were his people, who said, we don't want to be your people. Then God said, okay, you're not my people, and he will make those not his people to be his people because he loves bigger than sin. And while Hosea's prophecy addresses not only national Israel, but generations of Israelites and even unto individual Israelites, the gospel appeal to us is between you and your maker. That on a day like today, you could hear God's word and be aware of your sin and be aware that your sin offends a holy God and that you will meet him one day and give account for all your crimes. Every thought, every foul motive, 
all those things that no one else sees and all the things that they do see. And if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of David, God's own Son, you have in him forgiveness of every sin, past, present, and future you'd ever commit. And you find a love that is greater than your sin and grace unmeasured. Let's pray. God, we ask that those amongst us here today or any who would listen, who find themselves not yet to be your people, that they by your grace in the gospel would indeed be your people. And we pray for Israel, the people to whom you made those promises. We pray that you would indeed restore them to their Messiah. In the meantime, God, let us be faithful to proclaim your love to unlovely people. Let us be faithful to proclaim your compassion to those yet outside of it. Let us be those who are ambassadors of love and life in the gospel. We ask it in Jesus' name.